Dr. Ed Holroyd. Um, he has a BS in astrophysics and a PhD in at atmospheric science and much continuing education in geology at the Sc Colorado School of Mines. So we have a, quite a versatile person with us tonight. He's been active in the Young Earth Creation Movement since the 1980s. <coughs> um, 20 years ago, he wrote one of the chapters in the book in six days, uh, Why 50 Scientists Choose to Believe Creation. And I believe we have a copy of that here. I'll hold it up, and I think we do have it as part of our resource table, and we have our resources here as well. Um, he's one of the founding members also of the Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship, if you're familiar with that group here in town. And tonight, um, he's going to be speaking on Grand Canyon studies. Uh, Grand Canyon, is, as most of you know, is one of the most important, is the most important landscape on Earth to be explained by competing creationist and evolutionist paradigms. So Dr. Hallroyd recently completed research with Dr. Steve Austin and Dr. David McQueen regarding the formation of the Grand Canyon and will share the highlights of that research with us. And their work was published in the Answers Research Journal, Volume 13, if you'd like to go take a look at that. By September. By September, right. So we're so pleased to have a scientist with us and somebody who's local to the Denver area. We've been very blessed to have scientists who are local to the Denver area that are, that are very much involved in the creation movement, and Dr. Hallward is one of those. So we welcome him tonight. Thank you for being here, and we'll, I'm sure we'll enjoy your presentation. Okay. I think I'm live now, okay. and I will switch PowerPoints here to uh, escape out of yours, and go we'll find my man. Grand Canyon, and uh, though the 
uh, slides here have faded over the years. They've turned more reddish. Uh, this is some of the things that we saw. The Grand Canyon, the typical view from the South Rim. Uh, what was surprising there is that, um, that we were interested in weather things. And uh, this is the first time in my life that I've been in Corona. Uh, basically, I'm so electrified that uh, and some people around me are electrified, so our hair is standing on end. There's so much electricity. And uh, we found that if we could uh, put our finger in the air, uh, and it goes touch the guardrail or something like that, we'll get a half inch spark. Or uh, uh, maybe hold the ground, the uh, guardrail, some, some other combination, got three quarter inch sparks. That's a lot of electricity. Uh, of course, uh, you could say we high schoolers were stupid at that stage because uh, that condition means that lightning can strike anywhere right then at any instant. We could have been fried. Uh, but we got out of that all safe. And then for those of you who are old, ever see a Rambler station wagon? Yeah, a few of you probably have. Uh, <coughs> and around that time, my first car was a Rambler American, a little black uh, uh, car with a red roof. Okay. Uh, in 1986, I was visiting in that area, and I got a concept called Missing Talus. There are many cliffs in the southwestern United States where uh, uh, big sandstone blocks are falling off of a cliff, tumbling down, and then onto the flat area. Now, if this has been going on for uh, a long, long time, thousands of years, then uh, these uh, big boulders will slowly decay. They'll turn more and more round and get smaller and smaller. That's what we expect. But uh, what I found in lots of areas was that the farthest out boulders were large and angular, which means they're recent. Um, and right here from Monument Valley, north of Kayenta, a uh, very famous uh, place, we found some uh, very large boulders. Uh, and yes, large, angular, and nothing beyond. So something has gotten rid of all the old talus. So I have brought, introduced the concept of missing talus, and lots of other people have uh, looked at that as well, saying there, there's something going on here. I was also involved uh, in our uh, weather research. Uh, part of my uh, studies were to uh, look at data from our aircraft that were going into the clouds and taking measurements. And I wanted to know where were the aircraft. And so I made maps uh, on the computer uh, with the elevations uh, uh, shown on, in colors on the map. And as I was working, I was working in the uh, area of the Little Colorado River. And uh, notice this looks like a basin, uh, a little bit oblong, north, uh, west to southeast. Uh, and so I thought, well, what would happen if we plugged the outlet and let it flood? Uh, how much uh, of the territory would be flooded? But then I kept on going, and I said, well, right now we're that's close to the Grand Canyon. Why don't we plug the Grand Canyon into computer, of course, uh, <laughs> near the visitor center at the South Rim? And, uh, I'll let it fill up until the water's going to spill out somewhere else in the territory rather than go through the Kaibab. And when I did that, uh, I came up with these maps uh, about December of 86. Uh, the terrain map looked like this, all artificial colors, of course, but the greens are high ground and the oranges and yellows are low ground. And so then I plugged it at the Kaibab and uh, uh, resulted, filled it up, and uh, colored it blue. Uh, and I got supposed lakes uh, that looked like that. Um, and so I'm the very first person to create a map uh, showing possible uh, lakes upstream of the Grand Canyon. Uh, now, this is not, can't be accurate because the ground has changed shape. Uh, since the time that uh, those at the Grand Canyon was uh, carved, or before and after, and so on. 
but using present topography as a first look. And the volume and the area of all that water is equivalent to Lake Superior, the largest Great Lake that we have. And so they, and they think, ah, uh, take all that water and run it down a crack through the Kaibab, and you'll carve out the canyon in a hurry in a few weeks. Uh, and so that started uh, the ideas. Well, also, a couple months later, uh, I was looking at this photo of the uh, Monument Valley as I flew over it. Uh, I took the picture. And Monument Valley is very famous, and it shows up in lots of uh, movies of uh, the Western uh, culture, uh, cops and robbers, uh, and Indians, and so on. And stagecoaches running through here. It's being used as a, as a backdrop. But uh, as I looked at this, I can see all the cliffs in here, and I see all this sand wash washing away from the cliffs. And that reminded me of uh, there are some ocean beaches in the world where the tide is quite strong, and uh, water comes up, hits the cliff, and starts carving it, and recedes back out again. And then later on, comes up, hits the cliff, and does more damage. And uh, so, hmm. Here's where I got the missing talus uh, phenomena. Maybe there was an ancient lake shore uh, in this area that was washing these cliffs. And sure enough, uh, the elevation at the top of my map before the, uh, the lake matched this area. Uh, so another good clue. Well, uh, in the, for the June issue of uh, of 1987, the CRSQ, I mentioned what I had studied here, but I had to be careful because of, uh, uh, I was using a government computer for some of these simulations, and uh, I could not really say that I was doing it uh, at that stage anyway. Uh, and so I mentioned here, and, and you check the words, and I would say, uh, imagine, uh, plugging the Grand Canyon and uh, tracing out the, the lakes upstream. And so I was telling the world right here how to do it. And uh, after that, other people could do it as well. Well, I also contacted Steve Austin, and some of you may have known him. I'm not sure if he was a speaker for you. Yeah, good. Uh, and since I could not publish this, I said, you take it. You publish it. Uh, don't put my name on it, uh, otherwise I get in trouble. Uh, in fact, I really uh, was threatened with the loss of my job when I brought up the idea of publishing this. And so he uh, made his version of that as well. And that uh, was a couple years later that I allowed him to do that. Well, the problem with the Grand Canyon, and here I have a, a cross section, a vertical cross section, uh, 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 north to south, north on the uh, left, south, on the right, and shows the elevations along that line. Uh, and we have this big uh, mound here called the Kaibab Plateau. And uh, there's other lower places as well. Over on the left side, the low ground telegraph flats near the uh, border between Arizona and Utah, that was where, if I filled up the lake, the water would spill out. Uh, and so that was as high as I could fill uh, the lakes. Uh, and that's the red line that runs across this diagram. Uh, over here, where the Grand Canyon exists, uh, the actual elevations were much higher uh, by, uh, oh, did I get the number here? It's like a, a good fraction of a mile higher. And again, water does not like to go up over a hill. So that's been the problem for everybody's studies on the Grand Canyon. Nobody has figured out why did the Colorado River choose that location to make the Grand Canyon. Uh, physically, uh, that's not very possible. So there has to be some other reasons. Well, in the uh, summer of 87, uh, my family and my mother uh, took a, a tour of the uh, big canyons in that area. Starting here at Lake Powell, uh, we got uh, Navajo Mountain over here on the left, and uh, oh, this general barren landscape here. Uh, and then uh, went from there to Telegraph Flat, 
It is flat. There is nothing there. No indication that there was any canyon carving at all. So the water uh, never reached that level. And so any explanation of uh, the Grand Canyon has to account for the water never going through that area. And nobody's come up with that solution yet. Some other pictures right here. Uh, this is uh, the eastern side of, oh, this is Bryce Canyon. Uh, very high ground, and it did get carved and uh, eroded away. Uh, I'll bring that up a little bit later. Uh, all of these layers in Bryce Canyon had to be eroded down because some of them were over the Grand Canyon as well. They had to be eroded down to the Kaibab uh, uh, limestone level. So that's more stuff that had to disappear. Over in Zion uh, Canyon, uh, we've got this uh, Navajo sandstone, very hard rock. Uh, whatever uh, preceded the Grand Canyon had to erode that stuff out as well, because that's higher than the Kaibab. So some challenges there on uh, figuring out uh, what happened. Here at Marble Canyon, uh, this is looking eastward uh, uh, from the uh, north rim of the Grand Canyon. And uh, we see in the background here that there is a slope going up to the right. Uh, the ground is really climbing higher and higher. And yet the Colorado River is starting from the left and uh, uh, eroding down lower and lower in just the opposite direction. Again, physically, that is not a normal situation. Well, up at the end of the Marble Canyon, we visited there, and uh, it's fairly a flat uh, terrain there, top of the Kaibab uh, stuff. It's slightly domed. It's uh, the high ground right here in uh, the middle, and that is where the Colorado River carved. I did a cross section of that, uh, and uh, here again I do some playing with maps, and I drew a line across the, right here A to B, and um, yeah, I did a cross section of that, proving in this little uh, graph up at the top. Yes, that is high ground, and that is where the river went. It did not go to the side, uh, and so again we have a river trying to go through the ground, and even worse than that, it is going uphill to the southwest. Again, things like that don't ordinarily happen. Well, over near Lee's Ferry, between uh, the Marble Canyion uh, uh, in there, whatever, uh, to Lee's Ferry, there's this little uh, mound and some boulders that uh, Again, you could say near talus that used to be up higher is now down lower, and they're sitting on very soft shale, the Monocopi shale, which has been eroded out. And underneath this big boulder are my children. Uh, they extend only halfway up, or less than halfway up. So, big monster boulder suspended. And uh, later on, I did some studies. And I was wondering, oh, was there a lake level through there? And after the Grand Canyon was carved out in the west, there were some lava eruptions which flowed into the existing Grand Canyon, blocked it, and uh, regular geologists that know it created a, uh, a lake upstream of that. The level of that lake matches where these boulders are. Um, and so when that lake drained, uh, then the water goes away and leaves the boulders standing like this. Uh, okay, interesting stuff, I think. Uh, Little Colorado River is uh, coming in out of uh, the basin that I was first looking at, and it has carved a very narrow, steep walled canyon. Uh, basically, it has not been eroded to soft uh, uh, like features, so that makes this a young. Earth. And down here it had the map of uh, the basin that uh, drained through this canyon. Uh, looking at the canyon from, uh, uh, that's not my phone, <laughs> uh, sounds the same though. Uh, here uh, is the flat terrain, uh, semi-flat 
and the big uh, the Colorado River carving a very deep canyon uh, through that stuff. By the way, later on, I got to fly a helicopter through that canyon below the rim. It was on a scientific mission. I'll mention that later. Okay, south rim view, and we got the standard stuff, uh, and uh, there's all these different layers uh, that we can see from the rim. Uh, way down deep, uh, there's a tilted layer that the old uh, rocks are tilted, and then uh, on top of that, it's all planed off horizontally into uh, great unconformity, is a technical name. Uh, that we say is the uh, uh, remnant beginnings of Noah's flood. It just uh, planed off all high ground, made it nearly flat. Enough to build a few small remnants. And then the Tapete sandstone was built up on that, and then later on the Red Wall limestone, and then up at the top the Kaibab limestone. But then another, uh, like almost a mile of sediments on top of all that, uh, which gets up to the Bryce Canyon uh, type formation. Uh, so, that's a lot of uh, rock and dirt to remove. Well, as part of my federal duties, in April of 91, I got assigned to uh, uh, go on a float trip through the Grand Canyon. Most people don't uh, get a chance to do that, and I got a chance to do it uh, at government expense. So thank the taxpayers for that. Uh, I'll show you some of the highlights of that trip. Uh, I was supposed to hike down the Bright Angel Trail to the bottom and meet a raft filled with geologists who were doing uh, their particular studies and uh, a thing called debris flows. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. And so, yes, I started hiking down here. I had to uh, uh, meet that raft uh, and I knew it would take about four hours to get down there. Uh, Going downhill, um, descending a mile, is a knee killer. The last mile, I could hardly walk at all. And yet I knew I had to make it to the river to meet the boat. Uh, and I did. I waited there for a little bit. But for the next three days, I was popping aspirin because of the pain in my legs. Uh, okay. Hiking down that uh, Bright Angel Trail has some beautiful scenery. In the upper left here, I have the contact between the Coconino sandstone and the Hermit Shale. This is uh, pointed out in lots of uh, creationist uh, literature. A very clean contact, very flat, no indication of erosion, and yet there's supposed to be like 50 million years between uh, those two layers, which is absolutely absurd. Uh, these were uh, laid down one after another, different source materials, but uh, no time in between. Uh, a refreshing place halfway down is that Indian garden. And in uh, April, the uh, red bud trees uh, were, had these beautiful flowers. And there's an oasis here, there's greenery. Uh, and so that was refreshing. Uh, nice place to go visit. Farther on down, I uh, come through the uh, uh, great unconformity where we have a crystalline rock uh, below and to beat sandstone above. So this marks the, uh, the level uh, of erosion in Noah's flood, where it just ground everything down to flat and, uh, and then started depositing sand uh, and everything else up on top. And here is uh, the big of the river once I got down to the edge and I was waiting for the boat, for the raft. Okay, this is the raft. Uh, if you're going down there with a uh, tour or whatever, this is the type of raft you'll be on. It takes uh, 10 or 12 people to that raft, uh, and plus the, the boatman and uh, all the supplies in here. Uh, right here, uh, the raft is uh, sitting on the edge of the river, and here is the kitchen that we unloaded from the raft. And we set up our own tents uh, and uh, camp out. Now, when we're actually floating on the river, everybody is in uh, very heavy duty raincoats because that water is 50 degrees and getting splashed with cold water. Even though the hot air temperature, it, makes, it could feel nice, but uh, uh, it's a, a bit of a shock. Uh, and when you go through some of the rapids, you are going to get splashed. 
Okay, Th these geologists on this trip were studying what's called debris flows. And debris flows are things that happen when there is a, a, a flash flood thunderstorm uh, in the area, and a lot of water is in the slopes here and starts to wash rocks and uh, debris down over the cliffs, and it keeps going down, and all these boulders get moved. Uh, and may not show it very well, but in uh, this uh, uh, upper right corner, there is a very large boulder, twice uh, the height of the people who were trying to climb up to the top of it. Uh, and that was moved by the flash flood. It takes like a hundred mile an hour uh, river flow to move something that big. And then when it uh, hits the river, here is all the debris that's uh, spread out and it strengthens the, uh, uh, the rapids uh, because a lot of this uh, rock ended up in the water and uh, forms a little partial dam, raises the, the level there, and then the, the water flows over that. And so the geologists were wondering, where are these uh, debris flows going to occur and make the uh, rapids more dangerous? And so that was uh, their question. And that was the type of research that I did. Uh, there are some words about it, uh, but uh, in, in general, uh, my role was to teach these geologists how to use remote sensing data, the elevation of the area, to figure out where are all the watersheds and how much of those watersheds interact that with geology maps of all the different formations within each watershed. And they did that and figured out, oh, uh, to have it here, um, one particular level, I think the Supai uh, uh, level, a bunch of shales above the red wall, that is the critical area. If there's lots of that in the watershed, you're going to get debris flows. And so they learned something from that, and uh, I gave them the tools to figure that out. Um, and another debris flow at uh, uh, lava falls, and uh, here is the rapids created. This is the lower left, uh, and the, the upper right here. I have a picture of uh, people on uh, the debris flow, all the boulders that were moved by the, the rushing water. Also at that location, here is uh, what's called Lava Falls. The uh, after the Grand Canyon was carved. Uh, the volcanoes erupted on the high ground, and right here is a volcano called Vulcan's Throne uh, as a good landmark. And then uh, other areas, uh, we got basalt lava that is just flowed over the flat terrain and over the rim of the existing Grand Canyon and down the sides. And so right here uh, at Lava Falls, we got the side of the Grand Canyon coated in dark lava. Uh, Farther on downstream, we have a little smaller channel and lava coming over the top uh, of the cliff and floating down to the, to the river side. And then uh, at the very bottom, we have the lava floating off sideways once it hits the, uh, the bottom of the gorge. Uh, after that, uh, since the lava was laid down, there's been further erosion, erosion of uh, the, uh, the dammed up lava. And, about 50 feet farther down into the bedrock. So, yes, a whole bunch of geology happening there fairly recently after the Grand Canyon was carved. And if Grand Canyon was carved a little after Noah's flood, then that makes all this stuff less well, about 4,000 years old. And yet the geologists are, are doing pretty much dating on that, and they get a, a wide variety of uh, uh, things. I think Steve Austin uh, did some samples of the lava up on top, and one particular test said uh, something like 1.2 billion years old. Absolutely absurd. Uh, older than, uh, supposedly, than lava uh, at this below uh, the Noah's flood uh, carving level. So, anyway, um, let's go on. Oh, I mentioned uh, the lava. Uh, uh, falls, and when I uh, did the simulation damming that up, uh, it flooded all this area through the uh, Grand Canyon up to uh, 
the area that we looked at where they got these boulders that my children are underneath. And uh, the, uh, the shoreline's matched there. And uh, also up to Lake Powell. Some of the prettier things uh, in, uh, as we floated down the river, here is some Anasazi River uh, ruins near Crystal Rapids. Um, and so we look at that. Here is a typical uh, scenery as you're floating down the Grand Canyon uh, on a raft. And you see uh, miles and miles of that, that sort of stuff. So I took lots of pictures, of course. Here's a beautiful cactus flower. And uh, there are some side canyons. And uh, this is Deer Creek. Uh, and you've got water flowing and green and uh, uh, fresh water. Uh, very delightful place to go visit. And there's a little pond up above. Another uh, study that I was able to do, again, uh, as part of my government duties, uh, was to design a flight in the Grand Canyon, the Eastern Grand Canyon, and the Little Grand, the canyon of the Little Colorado River. And we were using an instrument uh, shown right here, uh, acronym FLIR, F L I R, forward looking in uh, thermal. Uh, Forward-looking infrared is used for thermal mapping. Uh, police uh, use those on uh, helicopters for night flying to uh, be able to see people and uh, other things in the thermal imagery. So it's for basically night vision. But uh, for this, uh, uh, we were using it to uh, measure the temperature of the Colorado River water and the water in the Little Colorado River. Uh, now, in the Little Colorado River, and maybe the other, there were hot warm springs, whereby warm water was flowing out of the rock into the river. And so we wanted to uh, figure out the locations of those, the easiest way to do it, fly a thermal camera over the whole thing. And so that was the mission, and uh, uh, I designed it, uh, just knowing the optics involved, uh, I had to figure it out, okay, we're going to be 2,500 feet up off the river. That's a, a half mile, roughly. Uh, and we first went into the, where the Little Colorado River joins the main Colorado River. There's a temperature difference there of uh, about 10 degrees Celsius, which would be uh, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's a big thermal difference for water. And so we flew over this junction at this little island there, and with the thermal camera, we calibrated the camera, the cold Colorado River and the warm little Colorado River. And then we went and flew elsewhere. And so that was the basic mission. Uh, some of the uh, imagery right here is uh, the, where the two rivers join, and the little Colorado River is a turquoise blue because there's lots of uh, uh, stuff coming out of the warm springs that uh, precipitates out the calcium carbonate to be technical. It forms a milk-like colloid that uh, stains the water and makes it turn this beautiful blue. You get the same color in uh, areas where there's a uh, lake downstream of a glacier. The glacier is creating a rock powder which goes into the water and creates the same light blue color. So just some interesting stuff. And then the uh, regular Colorado River is just simply muddy, brown muddy. Uh, the thermal image right there shows uh, the uh, main Colorado River black, which that's uh, the coldest we would want, and the uh, uh, little Colorado River water white. And so that was our scale. Uh, we can tell what's cold and what is hot. And then we would fly. Uh, later on, we were flying, and uh, uh, one area here, which I selected, uh, just all you see with your naked eye is just uh, the rock walls of the canyon, the river down below, and a bunch of boulders. The thermal image shows the river going through uh, whitish water coming in from up here. It's a little bit brighter, and so that makes it a little bit warmer. The big surprise here is that this is morning flight. Uh, the sand at uh, the side of the river was cold, evaporative cooling, like a swamp cooler. Overnight, that uh, sand, wet sand, evaporated and chilled itself. Uh, 
And so that showed up in the thermal imagery. And then the rock wall, you see how lights and darks there of different layers of rock. Some hold the heat, some do not. So just interesting scientific things going on in the canyon. OK, uh, now uh, we were flying 2,500 feet above the river. Uh, at the visitor center on the south rim, the canyon is a mile deep, which means we are flying below the rim. Nobody is allowed to fly there anymore, except for very special uh, permission. But I got to fly in the front of a helicopter, and so I took lots of pictures. Uh, these are pictures that basically nobody can take pictures from where I did. Uh, and so I share that some with you. In the uh, uh, Marble Canyon region, here we're flying up uh, over the river, and uh, we're below the rim, flying th through the canyon. Uh, down closer to uh, the, uh, where it goes through the Kaibab uh, uh, Plateau, then uh, it's, the river's a little bit wider right there, but we are way below uh, the cliffs where the tourists look into the canyon. Uh, right here where the river joins, the, the two rivers join, we're hovering right here and uh, inside the canyon with the rock walls high above us. Uh, and uh, uh, oh, just another uh, canyon view right there. For the Little Colorado River, uh, there's a turquoise uh, view and it's another thing, and we're again flying below the rim, and then later we pulled out of this deep canyon. Uh, so, interesting adventure. And of course, uh, we knew going in with a can uh, helicopter that uh, uh, they got plenty of room for a helicopter in that canyon. The next visit uh, was uh, Nearing my retirement, uh, this is in 2004, uh, I got assigned to take two scientists, uh, water uh, scientists from South India on a tour of uh, northern Arizona. I had spent the previous week uh, training them in use of remote sensing uh, data. Uh, and then, yes, I had to take them down there. Uh, and so, we went up uh, to uh, Page and into the uh, uh, Glen Canyon Dam. Now this dam, uh, back in 83, uh, there was so much water coming down the Colorado River uh, due to the flood situation that they had to release a lot of it down a side uh, tube down to, uh, and let it rejoin the river. And so it, they did, the water came down that tube uh, at maximum speed. And in just hours, eight through reinforced concrete, uh, the steel rebar also, and 30 feet into the uh, uh, Navajo sandstone, uh, hard, hard rock, and uh, carved out the canyon, or carved out the, the tubes. And the process was called cavitation. And so the Bureau of Reclamation studied cavitation, and then they repaired uh, uh, the tubes there. But uh, uh, yeah, when I worked at Federal Center, I was in the building where I did uh, the studies on cavitation. And I wrote a, a, a research paper for the CRSQ and how cavitation is the mechanism to eat through rock and anything hard in just minutes. And so that's the mechanism whereby fast moving, shallow water can carve down mountains through cavitation. Okay, well, since I was on an official tour, uh, the head of uh, the Glen Canyon Dam gave us, about three people, a private tour inside the dam, inside the powerhouse, that's the lower uh, left here, uh, and uh, looking up, uh, yeah, we went everywhere. And uh, so I look upstream at uh, Lake Powell and uh, and looking at the face of the dam there too, so very special. And then we went to the South Rim and I looked at that, so it was a big uh, uh, thrill for uh, the two scientists. Um, and over to Hoover Dam, and the manager of that dam gave us a private tour again. So we got down there into the electrical generation plant, all through the, uh, the, the maze inside uh, the dam, 
is the front face of the dam over on the, the left and looking upstream. Uh, the white is where the water level has come down. There was uh, articles in the recent uh, Sunday paper talking about the water problems out west and how the um, Glen Cane, well, Lake Powell is way below the level it should be because there's not enough water flowing into it. Same thing with uh, uh, Lake Mead. Uh, at, uh, we're downstream, they're using water too fast compared to what's available. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that's sort of our present understandings. There's lots of other research that's been going on uh, in the Grand Canyon, but this is what uh, my uh, 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 interests have been. Uh, lots more research is still needed. Well, um, when and how did the Grand Canyon form? And that's what's of interest to young Earth creationists. And uh, back six years ago, uh, Dr. Snelling and uh, another guy, I think he's a part of, of the raft crew, uh, did a uh, paper available in Answers in Genesis on how the Grand Canyon formed. Now they put up their ideas, not all of them work, but it's a good uh, approximation. So that uh, is a recommended reading. Uh, the paper that we just produced in uh, uh, September with uh, Steve Austin, the main uh, author, uh, that's available from uh, Answers in Genesis Research uh, Journal. And uh, for that, uh, we gave the history, like uh, my original outline of the lakes, uh, uh, we explain uh, the, how we did that, uh, and so on. Basically, it's, it's, it's historical in uh, reading, not scientific, that's a technical language, and Steve Austin is, was good at that, and explains uh, the history of our studies, basically, and a few uh, additional new studies that have come along. Uh, there's a recent uh, article by Tim Clary. Uh, he does not like our group of lakes idea. Uh, he uh, sides more with uh, Michael Ward that the canyon was carved uh, uh, when, uh, uh, during the recession stage of Noah's flood, when the water was flowing deep over the Grand Canyon area. Uh, and I think there's a ro role for that too, because all the overburden above the Kaibab had to be removed, and that's usually uh, a sheet erosion uh, is the, probably the best mechanism for that. Uh, but uh, Tim Clary is also mentioning uh, the, the lava flows down uh, where I showed that uh, everybody admits that Grand Canyon existed before those lava flows, so that's a non-issue. But uh, uh, this month I asked him the question, uh, why do you, do you persist in that uh, interpretation with respect to the Ice Age? And uh, basically he did not have an answer for that. Well, uh, I did some more little studies. I flooded uh, it higher in this diagram here because uh, there's this area in the basin of the Little Colorado River called Hopi Lake, and there's a modern Bitahoshi formation, which are lake deposits, uh, and there are several things, and that's the colored area right here. Uh, so there was a lake there. Whereas Jim Clary says, no lake, uh, and yet there's evidence for that it existed. There's fish fossils in there, like that. There had to be a lake. Uh, there are some other things that's uh, the Wittahoshi Formation, and down here some, uh, in the Hobie Buse area, some area where volcanic uh, uh, activity uh, heated the water in a, a lake and made circular rings of explosion. Uh, and so there's lots of those out there. Well, uh, freshwater source, uh, I've been attributing, and when I talk to general people, saying uh, maybe all this water came from the Ice Age uh, when there are abundant rains. And I could move it up a little bit uh, uh, before the Ice Age, still even more intense rains. Uh, and Basically, uh, in our context, Noah's flood happened, uh, carved off the terrain, 
raised up a, lot, a couple of miles of sediment, and then as the waters receded, eroded the sediments off the area, and then somehow uh, the ice of the Grand Canyon got selected for deeper carving. Um, and anyway, Noah's flood, uh, we heat the ocean due to the rapid flight tectonics movements, and so we have hot ocean, lots of evaporation, lots of uh, cloudiness, snow in the continental areas, uh, and yet uh, warm air involved. And Michael Moore did a beautiful study on that, where the ice age conditions coming after that. So, yeah, we got all the ingredients we needed to uh, deal with water and uh, lakes uh, in that area. This diagram is a little hard to see, uh, and I'm trying to show our helicopter flight with respect to the high ground in the area. That's why, yeah, we flew below the rim. Okay, for getting rid of uh, the sediments, uh, we have right here this horizontal layer, that's the bottom of Noah's flood. Everything up above is sediments produced by Noah's flood, uh, but it goes even higher than that. To, we put in uh, the Bryce and Zion canyons, then uh, we have all these layers right here, which also were over this, and now I've just artificially stacked those layers on top of the Kaibab, just to show you in general how much overburden had to be removed before you uh, approach uh, eroding the Grand Canyon. Uh, next diagram, a similar thing I've done before, showing where the Bidahoji formation comes in on that. Uh, okay, one idea that I had way back in the 80s, or in the 90s maybe, was that uh, okay, this lake level that I hypothesized, where does that come on the uh, Kaibab uh, Plateau? Turns out that's the la layer of the red wall limestone. Limestone can have caverns and a uh, uh, whole bunch of other phenomena uh, poking through. Now, on the geology maps, which I did not have way back then, but I got some now, I have marked here in this diagram in different colors, places where the uh, erosion of the limestone has created sinkholes or depressions, uh, just showing we got holes in this limestone, vertical holes, and there's thousands of them, and so there's probably kind of horizontal holes connecting some of these as well. And so this is all called karst uh, uh, features in terms of uh, geologists will recognize that. Uh, word, but maybe not uh, the rest of you, holes in the limestone, basically. Uh, well, also this past year, uh, some secular uh, scientists uh, explored this idea, and they say that, uh, oh, yeah, the, uh, there were some caves running through the limestone and uh, uh, created some cracks, eventually captured the Colorado River, which then went down through these tubes and you wrote them even bigger, but then you're undermining the overburden and pretty soon the whole roof collapses down in. Uh, that's an interesting idea and I think that's a, a, a good work. Uh, and so now uh, there's some flaws in there that they're talking about uh, uh, changing the tilts of uh, the region uh, one way and then the other way and not producing much good evidence for that. Um, they talk about lakes in the region, um, and some that I mentioned, others elsewhere. Again, not good documentation. Uh, so they need to do more work. We need to do more work. Uh, but we're getting up to some interesting ideas there. So here's a, a secular paper that is worthwhile considering. Uh, and then they have more detail here on how the water level carved through. Um, from east to west. And so, likely mechanisms for carving a <coughs> uh, Grand Canyon. First of all, we have sheet erosion removing uh, the large overburden, which is a good fraction of a mile. Tilting of the different layers to create uh, uh, direction on which the water is going to flow, and uh, uh, 
to make the lake higher, we got to tilt the, the landscape and get that telegraph flaps up higher and maybe lower uh, the south rim of the Grand Canyon. So some tilting may be needed. Piping, but here, and that's before I saw the, uh, uh, the secular paper, weakening of the limestone with uh, holes through the, the limestone. And yeah, I think that's involved. Spillover is what uh, we call uh, the lakes in my diagram spilling over the high ground of the uh, Kaibab uh, uh, Plateau. And uh, that was to fill up a lake, and then it flows over uh, the lowest point and erodes uh, the uh, downwards where it flowed over. Uh, so that's called spillover, and there's lots of examples around the world of that actually happening. Cliff retreats, uh, there's upstream cutting by waterfalls. You have a waterfall and then it erodes back, like Niagara Falls. Uh, that mechanism, I'm sure, is happening there. And this cavitation that I mentioned, once you start moving water at high speed uh, over some of these surfaces, uh, yes, the cavitation can pulverize even hard rock. And when I uh, wrote uh, up a paper for the CRSQ, I, I did a simulation of one of the side canyons of the Colorado, uh, of the Grand Canyon, and I let water spill over that, and I found, yes, that's cavitating most of the way down. Uh, so, yes, that is a good mechanism for rapid carving. And so, my point of view, I'm not, even though uh, my paper with Steve Austin and my initial lakes diagram suggested spillover, I don't think that's the only mechanism. I think that all of these mechanisms are contributing to the carving of the Grand Canyon in a time span of weeks or months, not millions of years. And uh, so, in a biblical time frame, uh, we have uh, uh, the crystalline basement rocks were made during creation week. And uh, this diagram over this picture was oh, coming up, you can't see it yet. Uh, then uh, the region tilted sometime uh, at or just prior to the beginning of Noah's flood. Uh, the region was flattened by the global flood down to the great conformity level. Then we had miles of uh, varying types of sediments that were deposited up in the middle parts of the flood. Sheet erosion uh, from the draining waters taking off the overburden and maybe piping through uh, the limestone spillover, channelizing. Uh, all around, more or less, the Ice Age, maybe before, maybe during, maybe after, and we still had lots of water around. And then, at the very end, the salt lava flowing over the existing Grand Canyon uh, and at the Lava Falls area. And then, uh, here at, at River Mile 108, I just uh, took a picture looking upstream as we floated through. Uh, and these rocks right here are creation week rocks. They're the crystalline rocks, the basement rocks of all the area. Then we have uh, all the rest of the sediments going up to the high ground. That's Noah's flood sediments. Uh, and there's lots more above that that have uh, disappeared. But uh, right here, we're looking at basically evidences from a creation week and uh, the effects of Noah's flood. And I think that was the end. I ended on that beautiful picture. Why not? Just under. Mm -hmm. And we'll get it to Do we have any questions for Dr. Hilbert? Mm -hmm. uh, you talk about a lot about erosion and that sort of uh, action. Did you find anything where there was upheavals or anything from forces below the surface that raised the earth during that time period? You yes. know, from uh, earthquakes or you know yeah. plate movements or yeah. whatever might do it. The Kaibab Plateau is an excellent example of that. Uh, it took basically flat limestone uh, surface and made a big dome out of that. Uh, 
and that created the problem for the Colorado River getting through. So that was a, an upheaval right there. South of uh, the Grand Canyon, you have uh, the Flagstaff area. It's totally volcanic. Uh, and uh, you've got the San Francisco peaks uh, up to 12,600 feet. Uh, over to the side, uh, the beautiful uh, one right there is uh, Sunset uh, Crater with a nice red top on it. The uh, recent lava flows that uh, erupted uh, only a thousand years ago. They got that from uh, uh, tree rings uh, of logs that were cooked by the lava. Uh, and, so, and the lava falls, the Vulcan's thrown. Uh, we got a lot of uh, stuff that we definitely had some uh, vertical movements and doming. Uh, another dome on the side of Lake Powell uh, is Navajo Mountain. A uh, big blob of lava has come up there, did not break through, but made a huge mound out of uh, uh, the rocks there. So a lot of activity. Okay. And with volcanism, that would also create uh, maybe some acid rain. Uh, there's sulfur involved in stuff coming out of uh, volcanoes. That combines with water, uh, and you get sulfuric acid. And now it's now believed that Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico was carved not by carbonate water, but by uh, sulfuric acid, uh, and much more rapidly. And so, uh, with all the volcanoes around that region, it's easy to have uh, acid rain uh, and uh, uh, stronger acid going through red wall limestone and eating it out quickly. Okay. So, a lot of things in our favor. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Do you know approximately the year last year that that volcano erupted? Um, we're not getting good dates on that. Uh, Noah's flood uh, will be, say, 4,000 years ago, or no, 4,500 years ago. Uh, so it had to be after that. So we may just say 4,000 years ago. And yet the radiometric dating uh, is giving absurd answers of millions and uh, billions of years. Uh, that brings up another topic, which I'm not sure that you've been in introduced to, is that uh, uh, some of the recent research uh, by ICR and uh, uh, CRS uh, as, is that most likely during Noah's flood, uh, radioactive decay was accelerated uh, by a factor of uh, nearly a million. Wow. Um, and so that invalidates all radiometric dates. Um, they look old because of the rapid decay, uh, but they're actually recent. And that was proved by uh, measurements in zircon crystals, which uh, are, are very durable. And uh, the helium created by radioactive decay uh, is trying to leak out of the crystals. And so they measured what is the leakage rate. And they found that it matches, uh, uh, it has to do with temperature and so on. Basically, it matches the young Earth scenario by a factor of uh, at least 100,000. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of things going on there in our favor. Did I answer your question? Yes, you did, thank you. Okay. Yes? Is there worldwide evidence of the great conformity? Yes, definitely. Uh, it is worldwide. <coughs> uh, some places it's destroyed. Uh, the Canadian uh, uh, shield, for example, uh, has been eroded down to that level and nothing has been placed on top. And so you just got the hard crystal rock up there. Uh, but elsewhere where there is sedimentary layers coming up, uh, the layer of the crystal rock uh, uh, it, it matches the upgrade of conformity. Now, there have been other areas, like in the Rocky Mountains, where uh, the upheavals have brought up uh, crystal rock to higher terrain. Uh, and maybe all that previous evidence has been erased. But uh, in general, uh, great conformity is worldwide. 
And uh, Tim uh, Clary is documenting a whole bunch of this stuff, and he's going around all the different continents and figuring out uh, uh, what parts of each continent uh, were eroded or got the deposits and uh, what, uh, in what sequence. Uh, and through that, uh, his latest findings were that over in the Middle East, uh, they were still depositing uh, uh, ocean sediments, limestones and uh, whatever, uh, right up uh, to near the top layers. Uh, and so Noah's flood in that region uh, did not uh, disappear until um, quite recently, which means uh, Noah's Ark could not have landed uh, like on Mount Ararat because that happened after uh, uh, all the uh, flooding had disappeared. Another side issue. <laughs> yes? Um, I was somewhat under the impression that the two different models differed in how much sediment um, would have to be assigned as post-flood versus flood. Yeah. Can you elaborate on yeah. that? And that gets into what Tim Clary was just finding, that uh, he is putting uh, the uh, uh, major sediments uh, up to very recent times. And uh, because the other one is that uh, they said the KT boundary was possibly in the, in the middle of the flood and everything beyond that uh, is smaller deposits and so on. But uh, in some areas that's miles and miles of sediments. Right. And, uh, that's cre creating too much geologic activity. And so it's, I, I think a lot of people are abandoning that level. And uh, we're getting closer and closer to the very top of all the major sediments now. But that, how does that relate to the two models for the carving of the Grand Canyon, or does it not? You know, whether yeah. Ice Age or immediate post flood. Uh, Michael Ward and Tim Clary are uh, saying that uh, all these layers uh, build up to fairly recent times, right. the great depths, and then the drainage of uh, the uh, ocean waters from the landscape. Uh, did most of the carving. Uh, that's still uh, post flood, uh, or no, the, the uh, as the flood was receding. Uh, my model with the lakes, uh, all the ocean water is gone, uh, and uh, but we got ice age water or post flood uh, fresh water that's coming into the area. The problem is just trying to find uh, the evidence out there in the field for a lot of these things. Uh, one of the problems with where the Grand, how did the water choose that location for the Grand Canyon? All the evidence is eroded. It's gone. It destroyed, it destroyed the evidence of itself. Uh, and that creates problems for us. Any more questions? Yes. Can you, can you make any comparison with the uh, Mount St. Helens eruption and the floods that happened at that point and the canyons that were formed with the Grand Canyon? Yes, uh, Steve Austin uh, did this study uh, way back in the 80s. And uh, on the north side of uh, Mount St. Helens uh, with a, a marsh flow a couple of years after the main eruption, uh, there was another eruption, some mud flows, uh, which then came, came down and uh, went through the Tulo River, and they carved out what he calls a 40th squirt, uh, scale of uh, the Grand Canyon. Uh, it looks all fresh. Uh, the the Tulo River is just a minor little thing uh, running through it. They just happened to occupy that, uh, the low ground. And so, yes, he is using that as a model uh, in, in small scale, um, a lot of the features are matching, uh, matching the Grand Canyon. So, yeah, that's ongoing. He wants to, me to help him on that some more. 
Uh, and right now, uh, there is no trail, uh, hiking trail, to, to look up that he prefers to look into to this what he calls the miniature Grand Canyon. And so he's asked me to design a, uh, a trail uh, for there, and I've, I've done it on my computer, and uh, uh, that's a good consideration from it by a team there, and then it has to go to the Park Service if they'll actually extend a trail to, so we can have a close overlook at it as we go hiking there. Yes, I had heard that uh, it, there was uh, like a pretty well, um, but uh, it was uh, uh, a fast, uh, a fast, uh, like, once it's the fall the itself, it, 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 the canyon that it created was uh, showed that the Grand Canyon itself was created in a short period of time, yeah. just like that canyon yes. was at the yeah, that came in just a couple days and it was there. Yeah. And so again, uh, if you have the right conditions, a Great Lakes worth of water, using my model there, running down through the crack, that canyon will be carved in a, a couple weeks. Especially with cavitation. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much.